Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very excited to have the opportunity today to um, present our research on emission trading and overlapping environmental support. Um, yeah, I'm a PhD student at Ghent University, and this is joint work with um, Klaas Müller and Martin Ovaro. So the context of our research, as you might already expect, is the EU emissions trading system, which is one of the cornerstone policies um, of the EU to mitigate climate change. And what it does in a nutshell is that it creates a market of tradable emission permits with a progressively tightening annual cap on emissions of large emitters, um, such as you know, power plants or steel manufacturers at the installation level. And the important thing is that in this way, it creates a uniform carbon price for regulated ins installations across uh, the European Union. Now, the EU ETS has been studied extensively, and there are many truly great papers out there that look at the effects. Um, for example, um, cost pass-through, um, firm innovation, um, firm competitiveness, firm, uh, the emission efficiency of um, firms. And we don't aim to directly you know, um, contribute to that literature alone, but what we're taking into account is that at the same time, there's an increasing number of national um, environmental policies being implemented by um, you know, member states within the EU with often um, overlapping objectives, overlapping with the EU ETS. So again, we also do have some evidence on some of those policies in isolation, but what to date seems to be understudied is the interaction of those two. So the interaction of the EU ETS with overlapping national environmental support. And in the first instance, why might it matter? Um, so there is some simulation best evidence on potential interactions and they can be actually quite complex. But our research really tries to be um, the first, to our knowledge paper, to provide some empirical evidence on potential interactions. Okay, so to give you a, a sense of what we're talking about. So um, if we look at um, some of the biggest companies regulated by the EU ETS and see what they tell us about their decisions in terms of de decarbonization, um, we find that often they explicitly refer to national support. So for example, here we have the German electric utility RWE um, that decided to retrofit two of their Dutch coal power plants um, with um, biomass co-firing. Um, and directly linking this um, retrofit to um, subsidies received by the Dutch government. And as you can see, they seem fairly substantial. On the other hand, we have a different kind of um, support. So this is arguably a bit less, um, less precise, but um, ArcelorMittal released a press release um, after the signature of a, a memorandum of understanding with the government of Spain um, to commit to a decarbonized um, steel industry. And the government of Spain in this press release more or less explicitly refers to measures such as compensation programs for electricity intensive industries that are designed to support the industry um, in the transition. And importantly, um, both these companies have um, huge installations regulated by the ETS. Um, so there's a clear overlap between those, um, those two kind of um, measures. Okay, as a second idea of why you know, we think apart from simulation-based evidence, um, the interaction might be interesting is that if we look just at the aggregate figures of these support measures across the EU, we see, uh, and this is I think one of um, maybe uh, the first contributions of our paper that, that we provide this overview, we see that national environmental support in the aggregate is actually um, really large of, o over our sample period. So what we see here in blue is the total um, number of, uh, the, the, the total amount in euros um, spent by national member states, by national um, governments um, within the EU on environmental support, but directed at EU ETS industries already. And we see that over the sample period, it increases from roughly 20 billion in 2012 to um, around 40 billion in 2020, so um, basically doubling. Um, and to give you a sense of the orders of magnitude here, what we show in the red line as a comparison is the value of the ET EU ETS, by which we really just mean the number of um, surrendered emission permits each year multiplied by the prevailing carbon price. Um, and we see that over the sample period, the, in aggregate, the national environmental support does seem to be um, quite a bit larger than, than, than the value of the ETS. So we would expect that um, it, it's both um, in, in, in detail for, for, the, for the firms that base the decision on national support, but also in aggregate that there's high levels of support available that, um, that might um, affect um, how firms behave in the ETS. Okay, so before going into the details of our research, I would like to give a brief preview of our um, main results so far. 
So our research consists of two main steps, and the first is um, that we try to estimate uh, the effect of regulatory tightenings uh, that happened in the EU ETS post-2017 um, on installations emissions. And what we find is that this regulatory tightening, which caused a significant carbon price increase, um, triggered the least efficient installations in the EU ETS to reduce emissions by 24% on average compared to the most efficient installations. But this effect um, varies strongly between um, sectors. So we find in the power sector a significantly um, stronger emission reduction of 36% on average versus 7% in the manufacturing industries, which may in itself not be um, very surprising given um, that the power sector, uh, you know, based on many estimates, has the lowest uh, marginal abatement um, costs. And in the second step, our um, research looks then at um, relating this effect of the EU ETS to the availability of overlapping national support. So um, what we find here is that at least in two instances, um, we find significant, significant interactions um, of the EU ETS with national support. In the first case, we find that um, power producers in countries with high levels of renewable support reduce their emissions by 30 percentage points more compared to similar power producers in countries with low levels of renewable support. And secondly, we find that uh, we, we find 10 percentage point weaker emission reductions in country industries with high levels of compensation for energy intensive manufacturing um, industries. So, so we have two interactions. Um, which seem to work in the opposite, uh, in, in opposite directions. Okay, so I will now go into the details of these two steps. So first, the effect of the EU ETS regulatory tightening, um, and then discuss the, how we um, look at interactions um, with overlapping national environmental support. Okay, so when we talk about regulatory tightening, what do we mean? So we mean two things um, that happened post-2017. So here we see the um, carbon price in the EU, set by the EU ETS in the period from 2012. And it is um, clear from, from this chart that you know, the price was, move, was moving a bit, but hovering around 5 to 10 euros per ton. Um, and that was largely recognized to be um, a way to low price level to actually trigger um, the decarbonization needed to reach the targets of the uh, decarbonization targets of the system. And this only really materially changed um, in the mid or towards the middle of uh, 2017 when details on the so-called market stability reserve um, transpired, um, which basically meant that after the adjustments um, uh, associated with the market stability reserve, or MSR for short, um, the supply of allowances would, um, would be dramatically reduced. Um, and once market participants became aware of these details, the carbon price basically within less than two years quadrupled um, to more than 25 uh, euros per ton. Now, interestingly, and this is then the second regular tightening that we uh, will talk about, if we zoom out further, um, we see that this carbon price spike is actually dwarfed by a second spike that happened um, that started around 2021, um, which was largely um, triggered by um, further adjustments in the context of the Fit for 55 package, which again reduced um, the availability or the future supply actually in that case of um, emission allowances, um, causing again a um, uh, almost quadrupling of the carbon price that reached then for the first time 100 euros um, per ton CO2 in, in the beginning of 2023. So what we basically will exploit is the fact that we have a period of relatively um, low and stable carbon prices before 2017, and then the significant carbon price shock um, happening after 2017. We will use this, um, we will combine this with an observation um, around installations exposure to the carbon price. So Clearly, we have only one carbon price for all installations in the um, emission trading system. But what we will argue is that similar installations are actually very um, differentially exposed to this carbon price um, shock. And what we mean by this is that if we take you know, two very similar installations within a narrow NAS for digit industry that produce the same um, product, so should be similar on all accounts except for the emission efficiency, then we would expect that per unit of product produced by an installation, the emissions in the less efficient installation are higher 
this then consequentially means that carbon costs per unit of product should be higher for the less efficient insulation. And that means once the carbon price shock hits, insulations that have higher carbon costs per unit of product will be squeezed way stronger, so will be more exposed um, to the carbon price shock. And we use this to basically identify high exposed installations um, and compare those to low exposed installations. So the way we think about the effect of the carbon price shock is really um, we look at the difference between high exposed and low exposed installations of the uh, increase in carbon prices. Um, so this is just notation. Um, we will use um, this indicator 1CPE to indicate um, if an installation is um, high exposed. Um, but to give you maybe a bit a more concrete idea of what we might be looking at, we can look at two big um, industries regulated by the EU ETS. Um, on the left hand side, electricity, and on the right hand side, steel. And the idea is that for both high and low exposed installation in both industries before the carbon price shock, carbon costs were relatively low compared, um, compared to or, or per unit of, um, of uh, product. And then only after the carbon price shock, we see that the difference in efficiency really starts to matter and kick in, in the sense that um, relative to the, the uh, value of the product produced, carbon prices increase significantly more in the um, high exposed installation, which are here shown in red. So concretely, this could mean um, coal-fired versus gas-fired power plants, or basic oxygen furnace versus electric arc furnace, which have significantly differences, um, significant differences in emission intensity. Okay, so we have these two sources of variation. First, the carbon price shock, and then on the other hand, um, the carbon price exposure at the installation level. And we use this to set up um, a form of difference and differences strategy. So um, technically what we do is we use a um, fairly standard two-way fixed effects estimator um, where we have lambda i, um, so insulation fixed effects and year fixed effects um, tau t. Um, and here this is an event study version because I will show kind of the event studies because I guess it will be easier to visualize um, what is happening each year. But um, what we're really interested in um, are the coefficients beta 1 s, which will um, represent the percentage change um, in emissions between high and low exposure low exposed installations relative to the year 2016. Um, and maybe just a word of, um, or a caveat, I should mention that this equal sign here is a bit of an abuse of notation because um, we actually um, estimate this equation um, via Poisson quasi-maximum likelihood, meaning that these betas actually have percentage um, difference um, interpretations. Um, but um, that's just a, a side remark. Um, so. What do we find if we use the specification in our full sample? So we have um, here indicated in the dashed um, vertical line uh, the moment of the carbon price shock, so around 2017, and we compare the outcomes relative to a baseline in 2016, so the, fir the last year before the carbon price shock. And we see that basically before the carbon price shock, so in the years before 2017, um, high, and high and low exposed installations were basically statistically indistinguishable from each other, um, meaning that they were um, on common trends. And once the carbon price um, rises significantly, we see that the high exposed installations start to reduce emissions significantly um, compared to uh, low exposed installations. Uh, and on average, over the whole sample period, um, we see that the reductions are 24%. Now, interestingly, you see that the effect um, kind of has a downward slope, so it increases in later years, and that seems natural given the evolution of the carbon price that we saw from you know, um, going up to 25 and then increasing again to, to 100 uh, euros. Okay, so this aggregate effect hides some significant heterogeneity between sectors. Um, so we split our sample into uh, the power um, producers, which is really just um, the NAS for digit 3511, so just one industry, um, and then all the rest, which we call manufacturing. Um, and we see that both in both samples, we um, don't see any significant differences between high and low exposed installations before the carbon price shock, and afterwards, the high exposed start to reduce, but significantly more so for power producers, where we, on average, have a emission reduction of, of 36%, compared to 7% in the manufacturing um, sector. Okay, so 
this was the first step in our research. So we have found a uh, um, you know, fairly significant effect of the tightening of the um, EU ETS on the emissions of the high exposed installations. And now we will use um, this baseline effect to investigate interactions with um, overlapping national support that was available um, to firms owning these installations at the same time. So the first step will be that we will aim to quantify national environmental support across the um, European Union, um, so across all member states. Um, and the way we will do this is by exploiting EU state aid control. So um, it's a framework that basically aims to ensure fair competition in the single market. And generally it prohib prohibits any form of aid where aid is defined as um, you know, fairly generally any advantage conferred by national public authorities to undertakings on a selective basis. So you can imagine this definition is fairly broad, so a lot of um, potential aid measures that you can think of um, will fall under this definition. However, although aid is generally prohibited, it may be deemed compatible under certain fairly restrictive conditions. Um, and generally speaking, um, that might be in the case of um, externalities or market failures where um, it is acknowledged that um, directed selective aid is needed to overcome these market failures. Uh, and one fairly um, easy example would be renewable energy support, right? It's usually administered at the national um, level and it targets specifically, you know, um, two low carbon prices basically. And it also is given on a selective basis, namely to power producers. So this kind of framework really encapsulates a lot of um, the potential measures that we can think of um, might be um, interesting if we think of overlapping with the EU ETS. And the beauty of is that the EU actually has transparency rules that require detailed reporting by member states for the aid that they want to implement. Um, so details may include uh, the aid objective, so for example, environmental protection or support of renewable energy, the type of instrument, maybe you know, a tax incentive or a direct grant, um, the support amounts, which will be the main thing that we will use and um, even uh, fairly detailed uh, disclosures on, on the beneficiaries of, of the aid, which can be firms um, in many cases. So we use these, we exploit basically these transparency rules to create a um, data set of overlapping support that is directed at EU ETS um, industries and that is exactly what we used to, or what we already showed in the initial chart. Um, so the aggregate expenditures um, of a national environmental support over, over um, our sample period. And we, um, this is kind of our starting point and we want to create with that data more granular measures of what kind of support is given and um, to which country or industry. So the first step is that we split these aggregate expenditures into policy types. And what we find is that in terms of um, aid directed at the e at EU ETS industries, it's really two main types that um, seem to contribute for virtually all um, expenditures over our sample period, namely renewable energy support and these compensation schemes for um, energy intensive undertakings. There is a component uh, that we here labeled other and it does contain interesting stuff, for example, um, support for R&D or investment aid for energy efficiency, but at least um, what we see so far, um, it is not specifically targeted in many cases at um, EU ETS uh, firms, so the amounts so far um, have been small, which um, you know, might or is likely to change, I guess, um, in the near future. Okay, so what are these two main policy types? So on the one hand, we have renewable energy support, which I guess many of you will be uh, fairly familiar with. The basic idea is always to incentivize production from, uh, of electricity from re renewable sources, so wind, solar, biomass, etc. cetera. Um, and um, it can uh, come in various um, forms. So we have often feed-in tariffs, but also renewable energy auctions, renewable energy certificates. Uh, and the nice thing about um, these uh, transparency requirements is that member states have to report actual expenditures, so it makes it fairly easy to compare, um, you know, potentially very different kinds of support measures um, in, a, in a harmonious way. And our oversample period, we find that on average, um, each country has given each year 40 to 50 euros per ton CO2 to power producers to support renewable um, energy support, which, you know, is, is a significant amount if you think of, you know, carbon prices, for example, before 20, uh, 2020. Um, 
the second category is compensation schemes for energy intensive undertakings and um, it's a bit um, you know uh, a broader category but generally it um, aims at shielding um, you know energy intensive undertakings from high energy costs and usually it is in the form of direct transfers or um, energy tax reductions uh, on average the support amounts over the sample period were quite a bit smaller than renewable energy but that is to um, also a large degree driven by the fact that um, it is much more concentrated in certain countries, in certain industries, because many countries um, apparently decide not to give these um, or use these kind of compensation uh, schemes. So, for example, we saw that the government of Spain was talking about the you know, option of using those, but uh, in the earlier years of our sample, they hadn't implemented these measures. Okay, so what we do next um, is we split our, uh, we define support intensities where we just normalize the expenditures at the country industry level by emissions. Um, and I will just explain the broad met methodology in the case of renewable energy support because it's just one industry, so we lose one dimension, so we can nicely visualize it um, on a map. But the idea is that we have um, in each year a support intensity in terms of, uh, expressed as euros per ton CO2. Um, and what we show here is the average support intensity put before the carbon price shock. Uh, and we use this um, in a first instance um, because it's nice and easy to uh, analyze a simple sample split where we split uh, country industries into high and low support. So um, here red and blue, um, where the high support countries are the countries that give on average um, support levels above the median. Okay, so this is in a nutshell what we do with um, the state aid, or with our uh, national support data. And we can then move on to looking how the effect differs, the effect of the EU ETS differs conditional on the available availability of national support. So we first do this for renewable energy support for power producers. And what we find is the following. So in the pre period before the carbon price shock, um, again, high and low exposed installations were comparable, were comparable across both samples, so high support intensity and low support intensity. And then once the carbon price shock hits, we start to see significant differences between the two. Um, we can estimate this difference um, directly in a triple difference, which gives us this kind of um, event study where we see that on average, um, the percentage reductions in emissions was 30 percentage points higher um, in um, countries with high levels of renewable support. So in other words, this suggests that renewable support significantly interacted with the um, carbon price shock and in a way where the carbon price signal was reinforced. So emission reductions were higher um, in combination with um, high carbon, uh, under high carbon prices in combination with renewable support. Okay, so we can do the same thing um, for the other main uh, policy that we identified, compensation for energy intensive undertakings. Um, here we see actually the opposite happening. So again, um, blue and red correspond to um, low compensation and high compensation. And before the carbon price shock, both were comparable. After the carbon price shock, we see that um, installations, high exposed installations start to reduce emissions significantly in country industries with low levels of support, but this effect is almost completely absent in the country industries with high levels of support. Uh, again, if we estimate this in a triple difference, we see that on average, there's a 10 percentage points weaker emission reduction um, in country industries with high levels of support. So in other words, again, this would mean that compensation interacts with uh, the tightening of the EU ETS, but kind of seems to counteract the carbon price signal. Okay, so these results so far, um, I mean, we've, we've run a series of robustness checks and they, um, you know, um, so far everything seems to hold. So one of the main things that we worried about is um, accounting for time varying um, heterogeneity um, at the country or country industry level. Um, so the, the reason being that our identifying by variation for the national support policies is exactly differences between country industries, but we can account for that um, using appropriate fixed effects, and we find quantitatively similar similar results. Um, we do a series of other checks, so we define, uh, um, use different definitions of our support measure. We use a continuous version, or we use a different normalization where we 
normalize the expenditures in terms of gross value added rather than emissions. Um, we also use an alternative estimator um, and include some controls and so far the results are um, all, all similar. So just to wrap up, um, what we find in our research is um, two main um, results. So the first is the carbon price shock in the EU ETS after 2017 led to significant emission reductions of high exposed installations compared to low exposed installations, 24% on average, but you know, um, a higher um, emission reductions by, from power producers of around 36% with only 7% um, in manufacturing installations. Um, and secondly, we find significant interactions with overlapping national support. So um, the reductions are 30 percentage points higher um, under high levels of um, renewable support and 10 percentage point weaker, weaker um, under high levels of uh, compensation. So this seems to naturally suggest that um, in terms of um, you know, designing of these overlapping policies, um, one should be careful um, uh, when, when, you know, when implementing them in, in, in terms of the potential effect that they have on the carbon pricing which is administered. At, um, at the EU-wide level. Okay, thanks for your attention. <laughs>